Welcome to this month's installment of Brass Chats, brought to you by Monster Oil. What is this? 21 year? Hey everybody, welcome to Brass Chats. This time we have a trumpet player named Jim Wilt. He's associate principal trumpet of the LA Philharmonic. He's been in all kinds of orchestras, played with, with all kinds of people, and uh, we're really happy to have you today. Jim, thanks for being with us. Great being here. So obviously, you've had a lot of success. Uh, I'm very lucky. You've played with many orchestras, Houston, mm -hmm. New York, Denver, you mentioned, and, and now the LA Philharmonic, and probably much more. Um, why do you think your career has been so successful? Part of it's timing, I think. Um, I ended up going to Cincinnati uh, not because I really wanted to. Uh, my, my band director, high school band director and first trumpet teacher, his brother played in the Cincinnati Symphony and also taught at CCM. Um, I also applied to Eastman and Northwestern. I got in, but the money wasn't great. And being uh, you know, a middle class kid from Detroit, the, the place that gave me the biggest scholarship was the winner, so I ended up going to Cincinnati. It ended up being a great experience for me. Um, the brass section at the time was phenomenal in, in the CSO. And um, I got playing opportunities with the symphony there, Cincinnati Symphony, that I'm, I'm sure I would not have gotten had I gone to Northwestern or, or even Eastman. Let's, let's talk about that since you, since you brought this mm -hmm. up. Um, let's go right into your training. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> who were some of your best teachers? Um, well, starting from college, because that's where it really started, I started to get serious about it. Uh, Eugene Blee was uh, my first collegiate teacher. He was a former principal trumpet of the Cincinnati Symphony. At the time uh, that I started there, he was second. Uh, but uh, a great stylist, a uh, great musician. He didn't talk a lot about nuts and bolts. We didn't do a lot of fundamentals. Uh, nobody has ever taken me through Schlossberg or even Arben properly or any of those books. But he had a great um, ear for orchestral rep, how to do it, how to produce it, um, different ways of, uh, of playing it. So you're, you're not pigeonholed into one way, but just to be flexible. Uh, and then I got to hear uh, an extraordinary trumpet player do it live in, in Phil Collins. So. Of course. Um, can you talk about lessons that you had with these people, with Phil Collins? Did you, did you study it all with Phil? I actually didn't study with Phil. So Eugene? Um, Eugene Blee, Eugene. and I know Mr. Blee was, he was a little bit sensitive about his students going off and studying with Phil. And I, I was very uh, <laughs> cognizant of that, and I didn't want to upset him. Right. Um, and actually, I didn't need to, because what it turned into is basically paid lessons. I would go and sub with the CSO and just hear it. And, and it made an incredible uh, impression on me. Right. Yeah, so that was uh, phenomenal, just to hear that on a regular basis, to hear the kind of volume, the kind of note lengths, the kind of attacks, all that stuff, the way the pros do it. And it, it, in that period of time, that, that trumpet section was really, really solid. I'm not that it isn't now, it is still, but it was really great. Uh, and then um, I was playing in the Dayton Philharmonic too for my last year at Cincinnati. So. Again, that was a little bit more professional experience uh, for me. And then uh, went to Eastman for grad school and studied with Charlie. But I also, uh, at, at, by that point, I already had a you know, pretty good uh, uh, exposure to professional playing. So it, it, it fed me in really well right. to the, that system, to Eastman. And, and Charlie then kind of filled some of the holes in the fundamentals and mm -hmm. particular piccolo playing, I think, is when I really learned how to do that. Um, yeah, it, it was just. What kind of teaching do you, do you respond to best? Um, or did you? I don't know if you, well, it was the last time we had a trumpet lesson, but. I did take lessons when I was in New York with the New York Phil. Okay. I started taking <laughs> lessons again with uh, one of Phil's old teachers, Ed Troidel. Oh, okay. On a weekly basis, cool. because there were some things that I felt needed to be shored up there wow. that, that were really bugging me. And so I sought him out. Um, I don't know if I ever got it right the way he wanted to hear it. You know, I'm sure it was very frustrating to him because I, <laughs> I had to balance what he was telling me with, uh, you know, I had a job to do. So I couldn't completely revamp what I was doing uh, in case it didn't work, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, most of it was just sort of going into my head until I could uh, find a time to, to work things out. And that actually didn't happen until I went back to Houston from New York and got away from those weekly lessons. And I was able to sort of uh, interpolate what he was trying to tell me, I think. Yeah. Uh, it, it certainly worked in a way. Uh, or worked for me in a way that has uh, continued to this day. Yeah. 
let's talk about this a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. you, you said that you didn't really get it until you got to Houston. How old were you when you went to Houston? Well, the first time I went to Houston uh, was in 89, so I would have been 27. So Played there for five years. Okay. And then I won the New York job. It was a step up in orchestra, step down in position. I went from being associate in Houston to fourth in New York. I played a lot of second when I was in New York because Vince was out uh, quite a bit, which I really loved, loved playing second to Phil. Uh, but when Vince would come back, then I would go back down to playing second on the little piano concertos and the overtures and that not even get, getting to play the second half because you know if, if it was a Strauss piece or Bruckner or whatever, only carried three, I, I went home early. Anyway, so, uh, sorry, I, I no, veered right. off the freeway that's and okay. I'm looking for the on-ramp. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my, I really want to know, uh, you said you didn't get it until you went to Houston. What happened? When I went back to Houston, when yeah. Until you went back to Houston. So what, what happened? What was it that... Change, you, you changed you in whatever I the think way you're talking about. Part of the problem was uh, well, when you're in a, a lesson with a teacher, part of what you're doing is trying to please the teacher. You're almost, you're waiting for the smack, you know, like you did something wrong. So uh, part of it was that I think I felt a little bit uh, um, encumbered by maybe his expectations because I couldn't seem to quite get what he was trying to get me to do. And it was very, very rudimentary, very fundamental. Can you give me like specifics? Like, was it a, were you having a thing about your approach or uh, time things or was it a sound awakening or what, it what was it? It wasn't a sound thing. He, 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 I think what he was trying to get me to do was really go all the way through my notes, uh, not, not back off in between notes. Um, at least that's what I took away from it. And a lot of what I, I teach is, is playing, playing the line. Length. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That everything is connected depending, it, uh, regardless of whether you're playing something very short or very long, it's part of a line. And, I, and uh, now uh, I think what he's trying to get me to do is blow through that. Again, even if it were short, um, it's kind of a strange concept. If you took a lesson with me, I'd be able to demonstrate it for you, but it's just, you know, just a way of, of, of not interrupting the energy, if you will. That's, that's something I've heard before is mm -hmm. uh, when, when the conversation comes up, what is different about someone who's trying to become a professional orchestral trumpet player and someone who is, the topic of length comes up a lot. Is that something that people who have made it understand and there's, there's, there's just this uh, understanding that you play notes longer if you're... Part of it's A lot length. of people don't get that, yeah. Part of it is length and I think if you're in a, a good orchestra, in a good section, you'll hear that and you'll just start to do it without really thinking about it and that's, that's part of what happened as well as I started to, started to move up. Um, I won't say the, the hierarchy of orchestras, but whatever, I started playing with better and better players. And they were playing more like, you know, the, the top tier players. Like when I got to Houston, for instance, John DeWitt was an animal of a trumpet player, <laughs> just a great player. And it was eye-opening to me. He was another guy that I felt like I was getting paid to come in and, and, and take lessons with this guy because um, he had such a great concept of sound and style and length and, uh, and uh, depth impact. So when I started taking lessons after that with Troidal, it's, it made more sense to me how John was doing it, whether he was consciously thinking about that as he was playing or not. It, it all started to make sense to me. Um, so it, it's not just about note length. A lot of what I'm discovering in my own playing and especially with students, it's the space between the notes where a lot of the trouble happens. It's getting out of one note and getting into the next note that little no man's land where a lot of things happen. Yeah. And uh, a lot of uh, players, th they're very cognizant of their initial attacks. Oh, I got the note. Okay, great, I got that note. Well, you still have the rest of the note and the finish of that note to pay attention to. And their little, uh, their little symptoms, their little clues, if you listen closely enough to, to whether you're doing it physically right, if you hear a little uh, at the end of a mm -hmm. note, there's something that needs to be addressed there. Or mm -hmm. a little, if the note flips up or flips down, you're doing something with your air, you're, you're, there's tension in there, you're tightening. You should that, be able to just you know, deliver all the way to the end of that note, no matter the length of it. That really makes sense because there's so much emphasis on the you know, your attacks. You yes. know, yeah, they have to be great too. Which but, they do. And, but yeah. the rest of the note, we're still, the, the audience paid for the entire note. Right. <laughs> right? So you better give them the whole thing. Um, uh, you, you have taken how many auditions in your life? Oh, maybe 16 or so, somewhere in that ballpark. I haven't counted them up. There, there are a lot of people out there who have 
audition philosophy. Um, uh, Mike Rolance, one of the guys, we, an interview we did with him, it was Boston just so Symphony, great. Yeah. Awesome. Player, yeah. yeah, Boston 72 ball player. Uh, he has this very detailed uh, preparation routine whenever he's gearing up or was yep. gearing up for auditions. Yep. Uh, why have you been able to be so good at auditions? Um, I'm a little anal retentive, that's part of it. I've, you know, a lot of the devil's in the details. Uh, so audition preparation is for musically. Uh, I don't know if I do anything much different than what's being touted, but there's a mindset uh, that works for me when I go into auditions and I, I, I get angry. Not outwardly. I don't you get angry? I don't, oh, not outwardly. Okay. I don't, <laughs> not, no, I don't project it. I don't want to broadcast it and give anybody else in the room anything to use against me. But inwardly, I'll say, these guys, are, they're trying to take money out of my pocket. You know, they're, they're trying to take food out of my kid's mouth. How dare you show up and do this? You wasted your plane flight. You should not have come here. And it's, it's like a, yeah, but outwardly, you're very pleasant. You know, you don't want to give any of that away. <laughs> so, because I was like, hey, Jim, nice to see you again. You're but like, it's, smiling. Hey, it's really nice to see you too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I don't want to be, a, you know, I'm not a jerk to anybody, but I'm not overly warm. Um, can you but tell me the, the craziest, I'm oh, sorry. Go I was going to say, I don't think it's anything I invented though, but uh, it, it certainly worked for me. I saw a blog from Phil Collins, uh, oddly enough, that said, uh, try getting mad, or I, th I forget what the other one was, because it's really difficult to be nervous and mad at the same time. <laughs> uh, and it is, it really is. It kind of sort of takes the nerves out of the equation. What does it take to win a, a top level orchestra job today? obviously uh, really thorough preparation. And it also takes, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, your tolerance of imperfection has to be really low, uh, if that makes sense. That, uh, no, I missed it. Okay, your tolerance of imperfection has to be oh, extremely gotcha, low. Gotcha, We're gotcha. We're always told that you don't have to play a perfect audition, and that's true. There's no such thing as a perfect audition. You can get pretty close, but but in the preparation stage, if you're letting things go here and there and not really paying attention to them, I guarantee you the committee will. Um, you do have to be very accurate uh, in an audition, but you also have to be interesting and musical. And uh, you've heard this probably before, you have to hear the context when you're playing those excerpts. And the committee needs to hear that you, you hear the other parts in the orchestra while you're playing. There's a certain way of delivering something that sounds like you've been doing this for 5, 10, 15 years, that you know what you're doing. Particularly the major orchestras, they don't see themselves as training orchestras. They don't want to take somebody and have to hold their hand until they get up to speed, whether that's somebody who's 19 or somebody who's 40. Mm -hmm. They want somebody that can plug in tomorrow and they're going to be a colleague and they can rely on them because the workload is such that you, if, if somebody isn't quite doing their job, somebody else has to work harder mm -hmm. to fill that hole. So yeah, a lot of it's that. And just and being very, very diligent about um, uh, preparation, knowing the, the repertoire. If you're lucky enough to win one of these jobs, you better get the music well in advance and know it inside and out before that first rehearsal. Uh, is preparation for, well, not just preparation, but trumpet playing in general, is it all built upon the three things that you hear when talking about time, uh, your tone and uh, right. the tuning. Is that where you start? That's absolutely you? where you start. Yeah. Those are what I refer to as table stakes. That's what you show up with. That's where, if you want to be even considered, uh, your sound has to be very attractive. There's no one perfect sound. Everyone has their, their ideal sound for their setup, if that makes sense, the most resonant sound you can produce. Uh, but my sound, for instance, is probably very different than Tom's or Chris's. They work together, but they're, they're, we're not exactly the same. Um, so yeah, sound has to be attractive. It has to be uh, ringing uh, in tune with itself. Your time has to be very, very good. Your rhythm has to be very, very good. On top of that, um, stylistically, you, you have to play in a way that's not only appropriate, but again, interesting. There's a little something extra in it. When it's appropriate, not eccentric, but uh, something that's just sets you apart. Um, these audition committees, are, they're hearing 50 or 100 or 200 or 300 players. And after a while, your, your eyes just go dead. You're like, oh, another Petrushka or another picture as you mark it off your list. And they're, um, they're waiting for that one player that walks in the room and says, I'm it. And when it happens, you can see the heads 
you know, come out of the crossword puzzles and everybody starts looking around like, are you, is this, are we hearing the person? Right. It's like, yeah, the head starts <laughs> to nod, you know. Um, you know it when you hear it. There, there's a certain magic, not only in the sound, but there's a confidence. Yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Uh, when you, ju you just said a minute ago, uh, your section, you, 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 you say that you have a different sound than, well, at least uh, from behind the horn. From I behind think the I horn, yeah, yeah. For, from Tom and Chris. Yeah. Um, Fifty years ago, those differences in sound concept and concepts in general within a section were probably much more dynamic. Would probably. you agree with that? Yes, because uh, again, it's been said before, but it's true. There's a homogenization of trumpet playing due to our access to CDs and things like that, and what we hold up as the ideal, people obviously they gravitate to it and they, they uh, model their sound based on a Hurstep or a Smith or Jim Thompson, whoever your oh. favorite player is. So there's more emulation these days. Uh, it's a lot, well it should be anyway, I think that's where you start. If there's somebody that you really respect and hopefully you've picked somebody who is universally respected, if you want to get a job, you, you better be tying your horse or your wagon to the right horse, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it starts with emulation, and then once you've sort of got that going, then you can kind of explore your own version of that. Yeah. Yep. So, can you tell me some of your uh, favorite principal trumpet players over the last, you know, 10 million years? Sure. I think Herseth uh, was amazing, particularly in his prime. Uh, he did some things that are absolutely current today. Uh, that recording of... Uh, PG, for instance, um, what else was on that disc? I forget. There is a Martin concerto for Seven Winds that he does. It's unbelievable. I mean, it, it, you could plug it in today and, and it, it would, you know, it would be state of the art. I, I could be wrong, but I think he sort of reset the bar of what the modern trumpet player was going to sound like. Uh, you didn't hear uh, the struggle, the physical struggle with the instrument. He completely had that under control. Um, the intonation, the attacks, everything was just there. Uh, the Hindemith uh, that you see on YouTube uh, with Hindemith conducting the concert music. Yep. Uh, it's amazing. It would be amazing today. Um, Phil Smith, obviously, uh, I think was probably technically an, an even more solid player than Bud. Bud may have had a little bit more fire, a little bit more uh, abandon, <laughs> like just swing for the fences in it, but uh, Phil's an amazing player. Uh, I think Jim Thompson, the stuff that he did with Montreal is definitive. Uh, that stuff is, it just sounds so good, so uh, alive and, and ringing. I think Phil Collins was an amazing player, uh, beautiful lyrical player. Um, you haven't said my name yet. I don't oh, uh, Chris. Uh, we'll cut, yeah, we'll cut that one out. That's Chris Martin, I think sounds great. Tom Hooten is, oh, I, he's already a solid player, uh, really, really fine player. And he just, he just keeps getting better. <laughs> and I'm not saying it because he's my boss, but... He wasn't the first guy that you said. No, 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 he wasn't. <laughs> but I think uh, Tom would agree with uh, my choices. But the thing is, as good as Tom is, he's still developing. He's still tinkering. He's like Tiger when he was winning everything and went back and reinvented his game because he thought he could make it better. And he did. Tom does that. Yeah. Uh, he came in really, really good. And he just keeps getting better and better and better. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, you have heard a story where... This might be totally insulting. We might cut this out. But uh, <laughs> I heard a story where he, when he was an undergrad, you know, people didn't really look at him like no. he was going to be who he is. Yeah. Playing, you know, subbing with York Philharmonic like he did last yeah. week or yeah. whatever. You played with him last week. Well, that's always the way. And but people looked at Phil Smith the same way. Yeah. They went to a, a school with him at Juilliard, and he was some Salvation Army kid. You know, well, look at him don't now, discount right? him now. <laughs> yeah, look at him now. I mean, Tom, I taught uh, briefly at Rice because I would fill in for uh, Monday. Oh. Uh, every year I'd come back and teach maybe five weeks after the Christmas break so Monday could extend his really? break. And I kind of remember Tom, but <laughs> no, not really. You know, but uh, oh, boy, awesome. uh, yeah, he's really put it together. You, you are associate principal trumpet. I am. Of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Yes. Um, we've interviewed, I think you're the first associate principal trumpet player we've interviewed. Um, we ask questions to principal trumpet players. Mm -hmm. We ask questions geared towards second trumpet players. Yep. What are the do's and don'ts of being an associate principal trumpet player? Because we know what it's like to be a second trumpet player. You're, you are, you're making the first player sound good. Yeah. And, you know, what is it like to be an associate principal trumpet player? I think my job is 
the same. It, my job is to do whatever I can to make the principal trumpet player sound better, whether that means playing fourth in the section, or if there's something that I can, that he can offload to me, uh, maybe uh, on the first half, that will allow him to really kill the second half. That's my job. I jokingly refer to it as the garbage man position, <laughs> because uh, it's not uh, that Tom can't play these things, because he can play anything. But if, if there's something that he doesn't really feel like playing, it comes down to me. The buck stops there, though. I, that's as far as it goes. I don't have anybody I can pass it to, short of calling the sick, which I don't do. Um, so it's my job to, to play whatever he doesn't want to play. Mm -hmm. um, he has told me that if there are pieces that I really want to play, that he'd, he'd be uh, happy to consider it. Um, but my philosophy, maybe this is the wrong one, <laughs> I don't want to volunteer for a piece and then crap all over it. I'd rather that he assigned it to me. That way I can be mad at him instead of me. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I, then I've got only myself to blame sitting there on stage. I, I can't believe I volunteered for this. Do you have an LLC? You sh are you, is your life a limited liability company? <laughs> my wife says, actually. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, so yes, it's, um, I have to be able to step in and play principal on whatever he's doing uh, in case something happens to him. Uh, the oh, so there's behind the scenes preparation. There there's is some. something big that you, you might take a look yeah, better, at what's going yeah, on. Yeah, because it has happened in the past where I'll, I'll get a call an hour or two before the, the show, like, hey, something happened, oh. you're going to have to step in. And sometimes it's okay, it's a piece that I know, and sometimes it's crazy, mm -hmm. hard, that almost impossible to sight read. And, and that oh. usually doesn't go as well as one would want it to, but you know, you do what you have to do. <laughs> but my skill set is slightly different, I think. I, I, I tend to be a little bit more, well, I shouldn't say this because Tom can do everything I can do plus what Tom does, but uh, the the associate, the repertoire tends to favor someone who's a little bit more agile. They've got a little bit more touch because we're doing the, the softer pieces, the accompanimental pieces. The hide the uh, Yeah, study. and just are pieces that you've never heard of. You know, we all oh. fret over things in school, all the big excerpts, and those are difficult. But some of the hardest stuff that I've played is, are things that you've never heard of, and they're like little dinky, uh, uh, maybe the first, the opener on the, on the show, or some concerto. It might be a, a Bartok piano concerto or a barber that's got some crazy lick in there that nobody ever talked about in school. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very different uh, job, but I, I still find it very challenging, which is you know, why I haven't actively pursued uh, principal auditions. I, I think this is the right fit for me. Uh, a question that one of our, Tom wanted me to ask you is, is, how do you drive yourself? How do you continue to drive yourself? You mentioned that you were uh, take, anal retentive. Take the two <laughs> to the, through uh, Elysian Park and, uh, oh wait, that's not the answer you're looking for. How do you drive yourself on trumpet, Jim? I'll tell you how I drive myself. I mean, there is a work ethic there. I, I do feel like I owe my employer my best. And I'm really fortunate to be in this orchestra because it's managed extremely well. Uh, just the money here, uh, I, I don't mean s so much the pay, but the, the, uh, the stability of this orchestra is, is amazing. So I'm, I'm, I feel very fortunate and grateful, and it's my job to do the best I can for them. But the other, <laughs> one of the uh, other driving factors is, is the fear of public humiliation. <laughs> it really is. I don't want to go out on stage, you know, and drop trow and, and make a complete idiot of myself. So that keeps me very honest. I, I should be at a point in my life where what other people think of me doesn't matter. You know, I, I would love to be able to do that. It would be so liberating to just say, well, I'm going to go out and play it, you know. I'll give it my best shot, but who cares? No. I That's could chip a you. little note and it, it would ruin an entire piece for me. You know, it's just... It's, it's what, what drives me. It's, it's part of the, you know, I, I don't know if it's all public humiliation, but I, I, I don't want to disappoint anybody around me uh, or people who pay a lot of money to hear these concerts. I mean, it's, of course, you know, it's my job. Yeah. Tell me your most ridiculous conductor story that you can think of. I mean, there was, there was a concert in Denver. We were doing Scheherazade, and uh, the conductor forgot the third movement. Instead of da 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 dee dee, he went bum bum bum. And the the orchestra went, <laughs> yeah, and the orchestra went da 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 dee dee da. It was really like this crazy oh. moment. And it, of course, you know, he caught it like within a 
two or three bars, but it was wild. We all knew what he did, but not, we're not ready for the fourth movie yet. You're just going to have to <laughs> slow this down, buddy. Can you describe the greatest musical experience of your life? Hmm. God, these are some tough questions. I give you an option. You can either tell me the most embarrassing moment of your career or the greatest musical <laughs> experience of your life. Well, greatest. Actually, I, I want to know both, actually. Greatest. <laughs> it's, it's hard to, uh, it's really hard to pin it down. I mean, there have been some really great ones. I mean, sitting in the section, nothing to, uh, not to take away anything from the current section I'm in right now, because I think it's a, a phenomenal section. But I remember playing Mahler 9, I think it was, with Phil Smith. Uh, I'd just been there for a few months and was playing second because uh, I think Vince was out with some ear problems. Bob Sullivan was playing third. And we got done and Phil turned and looked at us and said, this is the best section I've ever played. And it was like, wow, Phil Smith just said that. And it was, it was this validation, it was really awesome. Now maybe he says it to every new section that comes through, but I, I really felt that was coming from him, it was amazing. Uh, wow. It might be playing a post horn solo. I, I've done it twice here now. Uh, when it goes almost exactly the way you want it to, you feel like, wow. You know, I, I can't do any better than that. You either are going to like it or you don't. But that's, I've done everything I've wanted to do. Moments like that are, are really special. Yeah. Uh, embarrassing moments, again, that, that, that's going to be a hard one. <laughs> one that comes to mind when I was in Rochester, it's before I was actually, before I had the job, I was playing extra with them. We were doing Mahler 6, and I think I was playing 6th on stage and maybe 3rd or 4th off stage. And... Um, there's a spot where you get up and leave the stage. Well, so I, I, we got to that spot, or what I thought was that spot, and I stood up and I'm, and Bill Campbell and Tom Drake were also in the section, they're looking at me like, <laughs> dude, what are you doing? I'm like, why, why are they looking at me? Like I get up, I leave the stage, I realize I'm about two minutes early. I still have stuff to play on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so then I walk back out on stage, <laughs> play about six bars, get up and walk out, and they're like, they're doubled over, they can't, you know. <laughs> so that was pretty embarrassing. I'm sure there, there are worse things, but I've, I've suppressed them. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, I felt oh gosh. so stupid. <laughs> Even my landlord noticed it. He said, hey, were you supposed to get up? <laughs> and go I'm like, no. Why did you stand up? Uh, you said you didn't do the traditional Arben read through you didn't do the schlossberg you didn't do these traditional things right i did a little bit of arbin when i was in high school but just a little bit you just know a little bit. maybe some of the characteristic studies maybe a couple of the tiny things but if i had to sit down and use those methods schlossberg or arbin I, I just wouldn't know how do you know just to do a couple of these and then they'd flip over 50 pages and go to this and how did you know to do that i, I just wouldn't be able to put that together uh and even when i started as an undergrad in cincinnati uh, my teacher uh, gene blee was trying to figure out catalog what I'd already done and he'd name a book I'm like nope have you played this book nope nope I think I'd done Bousquet um, yeah and it, so it fell off pretty quickly after that and then so we started uh, in college with the Clark uh, characteristic studies didn't even do the technical studies characteristic studies then I think we went to the uh, Charlier and then uh, the Sh Shane's Shane Shane book and then uh, or Biche and then Shane's so these are things that happen later. Yeah. That, that means that you must have listened to a great deal of music when you were younger. That's I, what I, I would guess. I did, um, but worked through solo material and things like that. Um, well, in high school, I mean, yeah, junior you, on, you junior must high have been high obsessive to, to, be, no. to be what? Not that obsessive. I mean, I did play, but I, was, I started out with a really good ear. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, my mother gave me. That's, I, I would love to be able to take credit for that, but that was a head start. So that helped quite a bit. One of my earliest memories on the trumpet with, were playing like uh, TV shows and, and commercial jingles and stuff with her on the piano. We'd just you know, play duets together. So I, I couldn't read music for the first two years. Um, and then it was like maybe a couple of Rubank books and then a little bit of Arben and then I was uh, preparing solos for a solo ensemble and things like that. But I, I don't really remember a lot of yeah. Uh, Bousquet, like I said, was the other one. But it wasn't until I got to college where I started doing a little bit more of that rep. Yeah. And then when I got to Eastman as a grad student, that's when I started filling in the things I probably should have done earlier, like the Brandt book and Longinati and, you know, the Bain book and all that other stuff. But I, I never got around to Caffarelli or Bertoni or any of that stuff. Like so I, I don't even, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't even use it in my own teaching. If somebody brings it in, I'm, I'm more than happy to work with them on it. But oftentimes I'm sight reading it as I'm trying to teach it to them, which is presents a whole nother, mm -hmm. you know, um, 
list of challenges. Of course. I forgot to ask one question, and mm -hmm. it comes from uh, Trumpet Herald. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. uh, they want to know if there was any sort of major breakthrough uh, in your playing, and, and it, it, it changed your approach completely, or if it was overcoming a big obstacle, or an obstacle change, or whatever. Um, if so, what was it, and what did you learn from your experience? Well, I think I was always a pretty natural player, uh, all the way up through grad school, into the Denver Symphony. Um, but there were little cracks that were starting to develop in my playing that I really wasn't paying attention to, I don't think. I was just trying to play etudes top to bottom. You know, don't stop, don't stop, because that's what we did in trumpet class. I don't, this wasn't intentional on Barb and Charlie's part. Uh, they were treating trumpet class as a performance, which is great. If, if you know that's what it is, but when you go to practice these etudes, if you start hearing problems, you work them out. Um, and I think these problems manifested themselves uh, one week when both the other guys in the section were out. Uh, so it was just me and a couple subs. And th this is where you really realize how, how much you rely on your section players, the people that you work with every day to really give you the support. There are three different programs that week. Uh, one of them was a contemporary, one was a pops, and I, uh, I think I slightly overdid it, pushed it, and all of a sudden that, that feeling of just knowing where the note was going to be was gone. It was very vague, and I lost about a fourth of my, uh, my range and just freaked out because nothing like this had ever happened to me before. And, uh, and yeah, it was, it, it was really confidence shaking. Uh, I somehow managed to piece together an audition for the Houston Symphony in the midst of that. I won that one and um, jumped ship right as the Denver Symphony was going into bankruptcy. But I started my career in Houston on this shaky face. I think my playing was, it was strong enough where they didn't really know how much I was struggling, but I knew that, holy cow, how much longer can I keep this up, this ruse? Um, and I went to see Jacobs, thought he could fix it, and you know, all he basically, he's a great teacher, and don't get me wrong, I only had one lesson with him, but he was very frustrated because I thought too much about how it felt, and I think, I think, I th and he was like, D stop thinking, you have a mental problem. You think too much, you know? <laughs> And uh, so that, that was a disaster. Uh, again, not because of him, it was more me. I wasn't ready for that. Uh, a few months later, I scheduled a lesson uh, with uh, Vince Chickowitz. Uh, and then uh, the music of the Baroque happened to be passing through Chicago at the same time. So I, I called Charlie and said, hey, you know, um, can I meet for a lesson? And so I had a lesson with uh, Vince. What are you going to do with one lesson? I mean, he, he didn't really know my playing. He gave me the VC1 exercise and sent me on my way. And I met with Charlie and played five minutes. He stopped me. He said, you've played more off-center notes in five minutes than I heard in a year and a half at Eastman. You're, just, you're, you're hitting the right notes, but you're not hitting the right part of the notes. So he had me buzz some stuff. He took out a Soxa etude, something very uh, linear that didn't skip around, was very stepwise, middle of the staff. He, he had me buzz it exactly and then play it and then buzz it and play it. And it was basically retraining the face to hold up its end of the bargain. I was just kind of, you know, getting in the neighborhood of these notes and it just, you know, wasn't very accurate. So that was the road to recovery. Uh, so that was one of the aha moments. That was the, the face part of it. And then the other aha moment was with uh, um, Troidel in New York about the air thing. And it wasn't really an aha moment at the time, but uh, more about uh, how to support what I'm doing. So it, it's an equal partnership. And if I think if you neglect one uh, in favor of the other, at some point it's going to bite you hard. So I try to keep a balance there between the ear and the face. Yeah. Well, what can you say to somebody who is struggling with uh, what, an injury or, or a, some, some situation with physically or mentally that's uh, holding back their playing? What can you say to someone who's in the middle of something like that? Well, uh, find somebody who can, you know, accompany you on this journey because it's really hard to dig yourself out of that hole. I remember writing Charlie a note before I sent, before I uh, had that lesson with him, saying, "Yeah, it's been a great ride, and you know, it's been a lot of fun, but I don't think this is gonna, this is gonna pan out. This career, I think my days are limited." Da 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 da. This is back in like '89 or so, and uh, really thought that you know I was at the end of my rope. So, had I tried to dig myself out of that hole, it would have been over. I just tried to practice harder. I just I was digging the hole deeper. That's not what I needed. I, I just needed that. Uh, the right focus. So, um, 
they need that, and they need to be not as punitive in their, their practice. Uh, that was another thing where if you know, something was wrong, I, you suck, you know, I'd throw music stands across the room. I remember being in a rental house and th threw a, uh, a stand across the, the room and put a hole in the wall with it. I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's great. That really solved my problem. Uh, a, I, I haven't gotten any better, and now I've got to patch that hole. You know? <laughs> so uh, I, I learned that anger in, in that sense was very... Yeah. Uh, it just wasn't positive, you know, so. So it's um, calming down and figuring out how to work through. Be critical, but not punitive. Yeah. You know, listen with, with you know, your ears should be wide open and be very honest with yourself. Uh, as far as uh, recovering from the injury, you need to be patient. You can't rush something like that and uh, savor the small victories. Uh, you may never return to exactly the same player you were. I'm not the same player I was prior to 88 or 89 when this happened. But in some ways, I'm much stronger and smarter. But I, I'm not as confident, I think, on, on certain types of things that, that I was. But uh, I will grad, uh, uh, gladly trade where I am right now for where I was back then because as a player, I've developed much more. My sound is yeah. different. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm a big boy now. When I listen to the <laughs> older recordings, it was good playing, but it was like really, really good collegiate playing. There was a lightness to it, a, a smallness to it that I think I've gotten past. It's time for the monster round. Uh -oh. uh, just like all of our interviews, Jim has never died before. You've all seen it, so you, you can you probably been, yeah, anyway. Uh, these are rapid fire questions, and uh, yeah, maybe the answers won't be so rapid fire, but we'll <laughs> see what happens. Uh, what is your favorite space movie? Oh, space movie, maybe Galaxy Quest. Does that count? Yeah, absolutely. How fast can you single tongue sixteenth notes? Probably about one. Oh, well, how long? For how long? Uh, three hours. No, uh, no, no, for about okay. a minute. For a minute. Ooh. Probably maybe between 116 and 120, but I can do short bursts maybe up to 140 or a little. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Beatles or Led Zeppelin? Oh, uh, Beatles. I love Zeppelin, but yeah, yeah, Beatles. Uh, the first thing you listened for when you were on an audition committee? Sound. What is the best military band in the world? The United States Coast Guard Band. Or, or one of the other ones. The United States Coast Guard Band is the greatest band in the history of man and will remain so until the end of time. <laughs> what kind of mouthpiece do you play? I play what depends on what I'm playing. I play, normally it's, it's a Bach 1C. Uh, I didn't know it until Canstall uh, scanned it for me. It's a 22 throat. And when he told me that, I'm like, I won't ever be able to play this mouthpiece again because I thought it was like 26 or something. With symphonic backboard. Uh, that's, I do probably 98%, 95% of my playing on that. I use wow. uh, a JK 4B or something for my rotary. Um, I mean, I've got a multitude of uh, box 7DW for my pick. Um, and I use something called Fluffy, which is the secret weapon. That's like my American Express card. I don't leave home without it. And again, it's not my invention, but it's a, it's a flugelhorn cup on a trumpet shank. And that is a lifesaver. I would not leave oh. the house without it. It comes in great for low, soft playing. Or if you want to sound a little bit rotary-esque, pop that in. Oh. Like Schumann too. it's, yeah, it's a you, great mouthpiece. I would rather leave my 1C at home than that, almost. You wouldn't think that's a reliable mouthpiece because you named it Fluffy. Yeah, that's my cheater. <laughs> you, can, you can tongue it really hard and it goes, ooh, it's just, it's great. Yeah, and yeah, the rest of the section has them now. What's the greatest moment of your life? Let's see, what would that be? Probably meeting my wife. You know, that was a good moment. What kind of trumpet do you play? What kind of C trumpet do you play? I play a Yamaha Chicago, the Gen 1. Uh, yeah, so that's okay. what I'm playing. Uh, would you rather have a free Tesla or free ice cream for the rest of your life? Oh, it would be a Tesla. <laughs> because with that Tesla, if I weren't married, you know, I could get a sugar mama that would <laughs> Buy all the ice cream I wanted, right? <laughs> I wouldn't have to worry about ice cream ever again. Uh, how long does your routine take? Um, my warm-up routine is, it's probably about 20, 25 minutes. But if I need to, I can probably go in about two or three minutes if I have to, if I get stuck in traffic. Kobe or LeBron? Uh, I'd have to say Kobe. Who is the best trumpet player of all time? Uh, or solo, orchestral, what? I mean, Hardenberg is an amazing player right now. I think Smith and Hersa were amazing orchestral players. I think Tom is on his way that way. Yeah. Uh, I think Doc, I love Doc. Um, 
Yeah, just his right choice, down the center. Man. Yeah, his yeah. choice of music was sometimes a little cheesy, <laughs> but his delivery had so much integrity, had, has, he's still playing. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt in his mind where that's going. And I, I constantly, I, I will send clips to my own students, listen to the way this guy plays, the intention in his delivery. It, it's on rails. And, and that's so important. And that's a lot of this air thing I was talking about earlier. It's all about that, just going right through it and knowing exactly what you want to say. So, yeah, I've got a, a tremendous amount of respect for him. Fritz Reiner or George Schulte? Ooh. Uh, if I had to work for him, it would be Schulte. What is your favorite? Reiner would have fired me. Right. <laughs> uh, he'd have held up the two fingers like the, my first day. <laughs> what is your favorite place to play the trumpet? Ooh, that's a good question, too. Uh... Music for Ryan is a great place. Concert Gabao is a great place. Um, the men's locker room here is a great place. That's where I teach a lot of lessons, actually. Uh, I like wet rooms. Uh, I, I like a little bit of help from the room. Um, I don't want to hear every imperfection. I know it's the wrong thing to say as a teacher, but it tightens me up. You know, if I'm playing, if I'm teaching in a dead room, I'm dead tired after one student. If I'm in a, uh, not a, a a completely boomy room, but just one with a little bit of air in the sound. I could teach for hours. Jim Will, very nice to meet really you, Really enjoyed sir. it. Thanks yeah. again. Thanks.